Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is our weekly Chats on the Past program where the museum discusses history with scholars, authors, historians, and artisans. My name is Nicole Carpenter. I'm the Director of Programs and Education at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. And at the museum, we are always pleased to offer these free programs online, um, but we do always suggest a donation of $5 for our programs. It helps us keep all of these programs coming to you. We do also ask that you support the museum however you can during this difficult time. If you've enjoyed our programs and you'd like to be notified in the future, you can follow and like us on Facebook and Twitter at Westport History and on Instagram at Westport History Museum. During our program, if you have any questions, any anecdotes, comments that you would like to share with us, please put them in the chat box or in the comments box below, and we will go through as many of those as we can at the end of our presentation. So this evening, we are joined by Mr. Edward F. Gerber, a Westport resident for over 10 years and a past president of the Westport Museum. Mr. Gerber has served on various preservation organizations in both Connecticut and in the District of Columbia. And today, Mr. Gerber serves on the Advisory Council of the Woodrow Wilson House Museum, a property of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, as well as Chairman of the Stewardship Committee for, uh, sorry, of Preservation Connecticut, and a member of the Board of Overseers of Historic New England. Welcome, Ed. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole, for doing all the all the work. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I am thrilled. As everyone who knows me knows, uh, you know, when you when you see Ed Gerber, you think of George Hand, right? And uh, I just wanted to explain a few things about him and perhaps some things about why I am uh, so partial to him. Um, so I think initially we talk a little bit about his life. <clears throat> he was born in 1872 in Fox Chase, Pennsylvania, which is a town that no longer exists. It was absorbed into Philadelphia and the name was lost. He was a descendant of Alexander Hamilton. And it's interesting, uh, when, when we wrote the book about him 10 years ago, well, Alexander Hamilton, yeah, we sort of vaguely knew him, but now that's something important, isn't it? <laughs> his, his father was a blacksmith and sadly he was orphaned quite young and both of his parents died, and he was an only child, so we really don't know anything about his family as such. Um, he did have an aunt and uncle who, who enabled him to go to technical school in uh, Philly, called, a place called the Spring Garden School, and also the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And at the latter, he met some, met some pretty famous artists, people who would be famous, uh, John Sloan, Everett Chin, Robert Vano, and, um, uh, let's see who else. And he was greatly influenced by the Ashcan School of Art, John Sloan, Ira Glackens, uh, Lux, and Robert Henri. Um, but he didn't become a member of the Ashcan School. He, he was, they were more, um, I would say, realistic and urban than, than right. Um, in 1893, he left Philadelphia, quite a move to, for a young man to go to New York City on his own. And strangely enough, he became a jewelry maker. He worked at Tiffany's and um, we've seen some examples of jewelry that he supposedly designed, but I can't confirm it. <laughs> so it'd be interesting if, if we had something that he had actually done. Um, at that point, he joined a, a very famous club in New York called the Sal Magundi Club on Fifth Avenue, which is a, a great place for artists to network. Um, as a result of my in interest in, in right, I myself joined the Sal Magundi Club but I was living in Washington and didn't go very much, so ended that. Um, at, around that time, 1893, he decided that the way that he wanted to proceed with his career was to become an illustrator. And um, I want to read a little section from the book, which we will be mentioning tonight. It's the book that we, we published about 10 years ago. I don't know if you can read the title. It's called George Hand Wright, An Artist's Life Examined. And it's by a woman named Kristen Jensen. And we'll explain a little later who she was and how we, uh, how we found her. Um, <clears throat> I'll just read a little bit about the, the people who were behind the book. There were three cousins 
and I'm not a cousin, but I'm sort of a part of the family. Um, so in the preface, we say that uh, Wright's work provided a wonderful travelogue, beginning with watercolors of France, Germany, and Italy from 1905, its pastels and etchings of Fairfield County in Connecticut, Quebec, the American South, Barbados and Haiti, all evocative of a simpler way of life, offering a unique and wonderful way to know about such interesting parts of the country and world. And, and that's true. We, we, we did learn about the world from his, from his work. Um, so Wright was uh, not what you'd call an ambitious person. He was a Quaker and um, he did not aggressively seek recognition for his work. He was uh, brought up a Quaker, and the Quaker preference for simplicity and modesty never deserted him, even when he was a young artist trying to start a career and make a living in New York. A little bit of self-promotion um, immodesty might have been beneficial, but like Norman Rockwell, he cultivated a rather folksy image. Published photographs always portray Wright in a heavy wool suit. Yeah, I have quite a few of them, and he's always in the same suit, always a jaunty fedora on his head, a pipe firmly clasped in his mouth. Um, however, he really wasn't like Norman Rockwell because Norman Rockwell went on to great fame and great fortune, but uh, George did not. Um, I want to show you one image of him that Many people have seen this because it's in my living room. And this is a portrait that was done uh, by um, Carl Anderson, who was a friend of his here in Westport. And he's in his studio, which is just on the other side of my lawn. And um, everyone thought, wow, he must have really come from a trust fund or something. He's so elegantly dressed. But if you look at it closely, I don't know if you can see around in here, you can see that he's still wearing his etcher's apron. He was ready to go back to work. He didn't want to be sitting around in this costume. This was not really him. So um, anyway, that was his, uh, a great portrait of him. Um, hmm, I just lost a piece of paper. Well, why don't you ask me a question, Nicole, and I'll continue to look. Of course, of course. So why is George Henry so significant to you, Ed? Why are we talking about him this, this evening? And why is he significant for Westport? Well, let's, go, let's do Westport first. <laughs> he, he married in 1907. He married a woman named Anne Boylan. And boy, did his life change. She was from a large, large Catholic family. And suddenly, he had a family. And uh, it, was, it was really wonderful for him. And um, she was a great person, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I never knew either of them. But uh, I just recently discovered um, at the library, we had an exhibit about the suffrage movement here in Westport. And it turns out that Anne Wright was a huge suffrage supporter and in fact used uh, the living room here in, in, in my house as a center for uh, meetings of, of people um, in, encouraging women to have the vote right here. <laughs> so that was something we certainly didn't know about. Um, I think George, George and Anne came to uh, Westport really just to visit a friend and they happened upon this old farm and they thought, wow, this is quite a place. And it would cost $300, 30 acres, um, an outbuilding, I mean a barn, an outbuilding, two cows, a horse and uh, 30 acres. And uh, they said, well, this is a pretty good deal. So they bought it and Wright was, Wright was a pretty good businessman. Um, within two years, he had sold 20 acres and used the money that he made to really modernize the house, plumbing, heating, not air conditioning, that came with me. And um, built a big addition to the house, added a mo modern kitchen and added bedrooms, other bedrooms. So he was pretty sharp along those lines. Um, After he came, well, he encouraged other artists to come. Arthur Dove, Osip Linda, Carl Anderson, who painted the portrait of him, Keir Ebby, and Charles Prendergast, to name only a few. 
And one thing that we discovered, I don't know if Bob Weingarten is on, the, uh, is on this call, but Bob is, is a historian here in town. And he discovered, in looking at deeds, uh, that George lent money to a lot of artists to buy houses in Westport. And so in the, in the recorder of deeds office, they have the canceled notes. And I think it's pretty neat that he, uh, he was interested enough to encourage other artists to come, not just uh, lip sync, but also lending money. I, I, think, it's, I think it's great. Um, and, and they were just uh, extremely popular people. Uh, one story that I learned about, unfortunately, after we wrote the book, and it was a, a tale of a big party here on a Saturday night, which there, there were many. And then the next day, George got all dressed up in his famous suit, drove down to um, Assumption Church on the river, the Catholic Church, and Anne was all dressed up and they walked up the stairs and he opened the door, in she went, he closed the door and back he went to the parking lot with his pipe. <laughs> he was not, not a religious guy at all. <laughs> um, so I guess that's, we could, you want, you want, shall we jump into me at this point? How I happen to know uh, it? Why okay. don't you tell, tell everyone more about how you're involved with this story? Yeah. Obviously you know a lot about, right? Sure. And you've hinted at uh, <laughs> the significance of your home. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about what you okay. need to do? Sure, wow. Where have you been all my life, Nicole? <laughs> Any, anyway, um, my father was drafted into the army in 1942 and went to Panama, of all places. And he was in the middle of the jungle in a God knows what a tent. And he looked over at the guy in the next tent and he said, my father said, I'm Ed Gerber, I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. And the other guy said, well, I'm Frank Boylan and uh, I'm from New York, but my aunt and uncle live in Westport. He's an artist called George Handwright. So the two men met in 42 and we're best friends for many, many, many years. And in fact, um, I'm named after Frank Boylan. My middle name is Frank and he was my godfather and my dad's best friend. So I spent my whole life in this house and I learned quickly after buying it that it's one thing to visit a house and sit in the living room. It's another thing to own a house and wonder about that leak in the basement. <laughs> but uh, I've done it all. Um, so I guess that's how it started. And then when uh, the last of the Boylans died in uh, uh, 2010, I had been reading about West, and I was living in Washington, DC, and I uh, read about uh, Westport being the teardown capital of Connecticut, that anything old with some land was fair game for developers. And so uh, Mrs. Boylan's nephew inherited the house and he was a friend of mine in DC actually. And he said, okay, Eddie Gerber, this is it. Are you serious or not? And I said, well, okay. And I, and I bought it and came up here and uh, had it uh, designated a local landmark and uh, put it on the national register. And, and in recent year, I've, I've had it, uh, an easement uh, placed on it with Preservation Connecticut. So I think it's safe for the future past my life. Which is which is pretty special. Um, so what else Not with that? I guess that's it. Oh, the so book. We know that you're really passionate about preservation, and you have a connection yes. to to write. What made you so interested in in buying George Henry Wright's home? And I know that you have a large collection of his pieces. What what made you so well, interested to to acquire all of these things? It was kind of a joke all my life that one day I would inherit the house because my godfather was a bachelor until he was well into his 60s and darned if he didn't marry a woman who had a nephew. That was the end of me inheriting it. But uh, it was, I don't know, it was just a foregone conclusion that I would end up here and I wanted to. So it worked, it worked out very well. But um, we, uh, we, and when I say we, I mean uh, Mrs. Wright's great niece, Nancy, and great nephew, Paul, uh, and I decided in, uh, when was that, 2007, that people had begun to forget Wright. Who is Wright? They didn't remember. So we came up with the idea of publishing this book. And... Um, which I showed you a few minutes ago. And Nicole will tell you how you may obtain this book if you're interested from the historical, or from the museum. Um, 
So how do you write a book about an artist? Well, fortunately, we were quite friendly with the curator of the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme. And uh, she said, look, I can help you. I know how to reach out to recent graduates, the PhD graduates in uh, art history. And she did, and that's, we interviewed a number of them and we hired Kirsten Jensen to write the book. And she did a splendid job, my goodness, so much detail, it's, it's amazing. She came to DC and spent several days at the Library of Congress and interviewed few people who still remembered Wright, who were still alive at the time um, here in Westport. And um, then the next step was, after we approved this, this, the text, was to decide what would go where and what colors would be used. And, and I hired a designer in Washington who, again, I think did a splendid job. And then we hired a, a printer in DC. And I thought everything was great. I, I gave copies to friends of mine. And then they started calling me saying, well, you know, page 98 is repeated twice. <laughs> oh, God. And in fact, it was. So we had to pull them all back, send them all back to the printer. And they had to be reprinted. I guess that's all part of being a, a very nonprofit uh, publisher. I, I sold a, I've sold a few um, to various museums. In fact, the Griswold Museum has sold quite a few. Um, at one time, um, bookstores around here were selling them but that, that's kind of stopped at this point. But, and, well, I guess I'd like, may I talk a little more about Wright's career and where he worked? And, and this, is, this is interesting. He, uh, obviously he lived here, but he didn't spend all of his time here. He was fortunate enough to have enough money to um, travel extensively. So he spent most of every summer in rural Canada and, um, I've been to some of the towns that he went to and, and uh, he did a lot of etchings up there. So it's been fun to, to sort of find buildings that are in his etchings. And then he went down south in the winter. He went first to Beaufort, South Carolina, Charleston, Savannah, great places for architecture and, and history. And then New Orleans, of course, he loved New Orleans. And then Barbados and uh, even Palm Beach, Florida. So if we look at his, his uh, work is all sorts of interesting, interesting work from those places. Um, let me let me backtrack. I'm sorry. I wanted to mention something. In 1905, and and we've gone past this. We're we're up to about 1920. Um, he was hired to accompany a, a writer named Royal Cortezos, quite a name, to uh, Europe, and. Um, his job during the day was to basically sit in a park and sketch. He was, then the, the French term was flaneur. He was an observer. He, he didn't participate. He just watched people. So this is one of my favorites. I know you probably can't see it in detail, but here are two French soldiers. But what are they carrying? They're carrying fishing rods with fish. Isn't that fun? And so he would go back to his room at night and watercolor them. And then the next day, remember this is his sketch pad. The next day he would flip the pad over and use the same piece of paper for another image. So how much paper have you wasted today? And Wright did not waste paper. And so this is Notre Dame, so he's still in Paris. And we've been able to track his whole trip through Europe, that was in 1905, because this is the only time he, he dated his work. So we know that he was in Paris on June 29th, and then he worked his way south, and then he, he went into Germany, and ultimately came back through France and went back to the States. And I actually have the article that was written, it's called On Foreign Shores by Royal Cortezos, and it's from, it's in Scribner's. So I have a copy of it, which is kind of fun. Um, this is the house, and I'm sure you all, anyone who lives in Westport has seen this house. I mention where I live and people say, oh, I drive by that 50 times a day. I say, I'm sh I know you do. <laughs> Traf traffic is a problem, but uh, anyway. And people often ask me, where do you get rights? Can they still be obtained? And just, just a week ago, a friend of mine wrote to me and said, there's an auction coming up on Long Island and they have two rights. And so of course I jumped at the opportunity, especially when I saw what they were. 
I don't know if anyone present has been on the walking tours that Ed Hines and I have given of Kings Highway North. One of the features that we've added to it is to talk about a silent film cowboy actor named William S. Hart and his house was, is on Kings Highway North. And I have pictures of him standing in front of it. Well, look, look what I found. Look what I got at the auction. This is a poster of a William S. Hart movie from 1915. I mean, I mean, there's, it's, a, it's an illustration, but there's the poster with these little boys just glued to the, their, their hero. So it is possible to find rights. They are available. You just, just have to look. And um, auctions are a good place. How large do you think his collection of work was, Ed? How, how, I, I how think prolific it, of a, an artist was he? I, I think it was pretty prolific, especially etchings. He moved to etchings um, after, uh, well, he, okay, he started off as an illustrator and then he did watercolors. This is one of my favorite watercolors. It's, it's called Palm Beach in the winter. Isn't that, oops, can you see that? Isn't that neat? Um, and those of you who visited my house have seen this. I've had it for many, many years. Um, and then he went on from there to pastels. Didn't do that many pastels because pastels are very hard to do. And I don't have one to show you because they're also very large. But um, if anyone is interested in seeing one, please ask Nicole how to get a hold of Ed Gerber if you don't already know. <laughs> um, Wright was very busy during World War I. He did an awful lot of illustrations for the war effort. And this is the end of the war. You see he's, it's uh, welcome to Berlin and it's all of the allies oops, uh, marching through Berlin. He even received a, a letter from the secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, uh, thanking him for his efforts. And I, I have the letter, which was written to Mr. George Wright, Westport, Connecticut, and got here, which is, shows another, another world. It was written in 1918. Um, so anyway, we have uh, quite a few etchings. And they're not, unfortunately, they're not numbered. You know, some of them are like 10 out of 100 or something. He didn't do that. This, this one we've produced as a postcard for the museum, which is really kind of special. It's called Campo Beach, Westport. Look at the, the, the costumes, <laughs> they're amazing. <laughs> so, but, and you know, I didn't have this one. It took me quite a while to find this, but I, I found it. I've forgotten where I got it, but um, anyway, I've enjoyed having it. And then th this one, I, I just wanted to mention, it's a George Washington scene. Um, and it's hard to see, but, uh, in, in the, to celebrate the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birth, the uh, etcher John Taylor Arms, noted, noted Fairfield artist and president of the Society of American Etchers, um, asked the, the people who he considered to be the foremost etchers of the time to submit examples of their work to him, which were included in a portfolio which was given to uh, President Hoover. So here I have a picture of of uh, Hoover getting the uh, the etchings from John Taylor Arms. So anyway, it's George Washington at Valley Forge, fairly um, a, fa a fairly common scene. I don't know how many of you have ever seen this. This is the sort of thing that was done by an artist when he first started out. He would paint the top of a tobacco of a uh, cigarette or cigar box. So Wright did this as well. They're not dated and exactly what it, where it is, I don't know. It's a winter scene, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, so. You have a very large collection, Ed. We, we know this, it's a magnificent collection. Out of all of the pieces, you, you've shown us one of your favorites on, um, in Florida. What do you admire most about George Ann Wright's work as a whole? I think his humanity. I mean, he's able to show all sorts of people 
doing all sorts of things. This, isn't it great to be able to just reach for the wall and pull one off? This is, a, this is called um, Perfect Balance. And it's a woman, a Barbadian woman walking through the streets with uh, fruit on her head. And, you know, no condescension is involved. It's, it's just what he saw and um, captured beautifully. Um, I, I like uh, a lot of his architectural scenes because, as you know, I like historic buildings. And I have the whole mm, pattern, the whole uh, scenario of, an, of, the, of the etching world. I have the drawing that he did. So in, in other words, like in, I think in New Orleans, and we, I'm, I, I hope a number of you came to the uh, George Wright exhibit that we had at the museum last year, but we tried to include a few of those uh, uh, series. So we started off with George's drawing of a scene in New Orleans. Then he came back here and in his studio, which again is out on the other side of the lawn, he uh, made an etching plate. And then he ran the, uh, the plate through his um, um, press right out there. So, and I have all three in a row, which is kind of neat. And it's, it's fun to see how he changed them. He, uh, in the initial drawing, he only had one person. Then when he did the plate, he added another person. I don't know why, maybe for balance or whatever, but, but he did. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, that's. My, uh, my final question for you, Ed, before we turn over to our audience questions, we do have a couple, is uh, what do you think that people should take away from Wright's work? Is it his humanity? Is it his, uh, his I think so. sincerity and his uh, humbleness. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, when he died, on oh, his years, incidentally, were uh, 1872 to 1951. And in his obituary, it says that he died after a long illness, which makes me sad. I don't, I don't know what it was, but the fact that he had that pipe in his mouth all the time, I think might tell, give us a hint. But uh, he died in this house. Um, and, uh, and his wife died three years later and they're buried not too far from here at Willowbrook Cemetery. And again, if you know Willowbrook Cemetery, there's some huge mausoleums there. i um, especially the, the Leonard mausoleum for, for the Stu Leonard, but the Wright graves are very modest, very small. And when I came along, very overgrown, but not anymore. <laughs> now I've taken it upon myself to, uh, trim them or contribute to the, uh, fund that does does things like that. Um, we had a few years ago, and I think you, you've done it again fairly recently, Nicole, as we've had uh, uh, a tour of the cemetery and someone played George Wright, which is fun. <laughs> Brought him back to life and they were dressed like him standing right near, near his grave. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Um, we always try to bring the history back to life at the museum, at least in a little piece. Um, we do have a question here, Ed, when you mentioned the auction that you uh, recently yes. were part of, you said there were two pieces and you only showed us one. <laughs> well, the other one I didn't like as much and I didn't have it framed. Uh, the other one, it's, it's a, another um, group of people looking at a poster of a movie, but it didn't have William S. Hart, so I wasn't interested. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I literally just got this uh, this heart uh, etching on Sunday, and my cousin is a framer, so he gave gave this to me today so that I could have it to show you all today. But uh, so I, I do add I do add things quite a bit. Um, I have uh, duplicates of a lot of etchings and have donated them to the museum for various fundraisers. Um, so always keeping in mind that I keep one copy for my collection and I have tried to um, keep everything organized. So, you know, I have a, a big binder over here, which has illustrations, pastels, etchings, the whole thing right there. Um, we have another question here, Ed. Um, we have Monica uh, and she says she lives in DC. 
uh, or she lived in DC rather in the 1980s and worked part-time at the Phillips Collection. She says another young woman who worked there told her that this woman's dad, whose last name was Wright, taught in one of the local art departments. And do you think this DC Wright might be related to your Wright? I, I don't, unfortunately, no. I, I don't, I, as I said, I really don't know anything about the rights, his rights. Boy, imagine when I was young, I had my godfather who was Frank Boylan and his uncle was George Hand Wright. And often it got mixed up that the uncle was, was the architect. <laughs> and he wasn't, of course. So, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's the case. Um, a, a number of museums have rights in their collection. Unfortunately, some have deaccessioned them through the years. Um, not sure exactly why. This, the the uh, image on the cover is a great favorite of mine. It, it looks like, we always thought it looked like a great Gatsby scene, something from the smart set. And uh, one of the things that I love about Wright is that as I, as I do more research, I'm able to find uh, the magazine that he did the etching, the illustration for. So it's, it's really fun to find things. Like I just bought a book uh, that includes a number of rights and one of them, I have the original etching right, right here in my house. And so that's what it was for, that book, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um, a few of our audience members really love the, the image on the cover of the book. They, they uh, really love that one. Oh, great. Yeah, <laughs> it's really, it's really a, a wonderful image. I was lucky when I went off to college, my godfather gave me a bunch of rights to bring. So when other boys at Georgetown had pictures of, I don't know who, <laughs> Catherine Deneuve or Jane Fonda or somebody in their room. I had George Wright's all over the walls and, and I still have them. So <laughs> some things never change. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, if we have any other questions for Ed, please do answer them um, in the comment box and I will be happy to pass those along. Uh, also, when we have this recording go onto Facebook, we will have the link to buy the book in the description as well, if you would like a copy um, of the artist, An Artist's Life Examined for yourself. Um, and we do, of course, always thank Ed for his contributions to the museum. He was um, a large part of the exhibit that we had in 2019 that you mentioned, um, Vision and Dignity, which was all um, almost all of your pieces, I think, Ed. I think. Oh no! Had... That's just, well, that's because <laughs> you carried so many of them to your car. I remember this, this is the exhibit that Nicole was talking about. See, I keep it close at hand. <laughs> uh, no, I really do have. I have too many. People say, "Well, okay, Ed, you are not a young man. What is going to happen to this collection when you are no longer here?" And the answer is, I don't know. I'm not sure. I would. I would love it if in 20, 10, 10 years, a museum would say, yes, I would love to take this collection and keep it together. That would be great. But um, so far, no one has been knocking on the door. So who knows? Nicole, that's you. That's your job in the future. You could find someone who might want the entire collection. <laughs> I'll work on that, Ed. Okay. We, do have, um, we do have another question um, from Randy Henkels. He says, I know him well. Yes. He <laughs> says, I'm realizing that my grandfather, Charles Henkels, may have gone to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts about the same time as Wright. And he wonders, can you give us the time or the period that Wright attended the Academy? Um, yes, I can. Nicole, tell, tell something else. Tell something else while I look this up. <laughs> tell about an upcoming event. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we always hold these, uh, these chats on the past on Fridays, and we are very lucky to, to have all of these authors and artisans, historians join us. Um, we, of course, are always honored when Ed helps us with um, programs such as tonight's. And I really do encourage everyone to get a copy of the book. It really does go into to George's um, life, but it also has some wonderful images in there. Um, I, I really love to look at the images. And that book was actually extremely 
um, important while we were creating the exhibit um, last year and it really helped with our interpretation. Great. Um, Randy, I, I note here that he attended uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Academy between 1890 and 1891. And again, you know, as I said, he, many people asked if he, if he had a trust fund. No, there was no trust fund. So he was taking night classes and working odd jobs during the day. Um, and he was worked primarily with the uh, uh, artist Robert Vano, who is featured in the book. I don't know if you can, can see it. This is a portrait that Vano did in about uh, 1910 of Woodrow Wilson's first wife and his three daughters at, in Cornish, New Hampshire. And it's at the Woodrow Wilson house in Washington. Um, it, do we have any members of the uh, Boylan family on the phone? No, uh, I guess not. We, if, if when you buy the book, you'll notice that two of the um, people who were involved with the book in, initially, in other words, who paid for it, uh, are, are mentioned as living in Lima, Peru. And how is that? That's an interesting question. I said that when George married Anne Wright, he married into a big family. And one of Anne's nieces uh, was summering in Madison, Connecticut in uh, 1940. And she met a very handsome and fortunately very rich Peruvian who had just graduated from, from MIT. <laughs> and after a year of separation, both families said, no, separate. They married and uh, had a wonderful life in Lima. And their son is very supportive. He came to the opening of the right exhibit all the way from Lima and was one of the major fundraisers for it, or one of the major donors. And uh, he's a, so I was hoping he might somehow be on the phone. He, um, I'll show you one that he owns this one, which is kind of unusual. It's an oil painting. There are very few oils. And uh, this was given to Paul Rizzo Patron by Mrs. Boylan, who was the last member of the family to live here. And it was in, sh it was, it was all ripped. It was in shambles and he had it restored. And it's, it's my dining room right here. So I think it's kind of neat. I'm trying to figure out a way to get it away from him, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so is there anything else you'd like to share with, with our audience tonight, Ed, before we uh, enjoy the rest of our weekend? Well, I mean, I think it's fun to find an artist you like and really concentrate on him. I mean, I know there are many, many artists and many, many artists. And right here on my desk, I have postcards from many of them. But, you know, finding one who you really think is special and doing a, a book about, about them and becoming kind of a... a promoter of them and a, uh, it's fun. It's, it's, uh, it's a, a satisfying project. And during the pandemic, what was I doing? I was cataloging and organizing the, the rights, of course. <laughs> I never uh, lacked for anything to do as long as I had the rights all around me. So I, I would suggest that, that people do that. How about you, Nicole? Do you collect a certain artist? Uh, I collect books. Books. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I do. I'm very glad to hear about the cataloging. That's an extremely important part of, of any collection is, is keeping yes. track of what you have, especially with an art collection as significant as yours, Ed. I think it is, is really key to preserving that collection. Um, and, and, and I'm so glad to hear that that's what's you, what you've been doing during our, uh, our quarantine. And everything is accession. Do you see back here is the accession number? <laughs> You taught me well. <laughs> so well, thank you so much for, for your efforts, Ed, and also for joining us this evening. It really was. Thank you. It's always wonderful to, to take a look at your collection, and it's always a lot of fun to talk about. Um, thank you. Right Thanks to everyone for participating. Yes. So thank you, everyone. We will be uh, back in two weeks when we speak with Mary Thom uh, Thompson, who is the research historian at Mount Vernon. We're going to speak about her book, um, and I do hope that you will join us then. So thank you once again, Ed. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, and enjoy your evening. <laughs>